Hi everyone, this is Duncan from the podcast Under the Stairs. This particular video you're checking out just now has the archival recording attached to it. The archival recording is from our podography, I think that's the term that we use, um, and it will feature reviews of movies that fall under the 88 Films Italian Collection series. Now, the vast majority of reviews we've done over the last five years have been in audio format and published on our RSS feed for the podcast. We are transitioning over to give you access to all those reviews right here on YouTube under a playlist. Now, we're doing that because we're about to do our first video recording of E88 Films Italian collection release, that being Tentacles. So there's plenty of opportunity to delve into the back catalogue of the reviews here. And if you like what you hear, then please hit subscribe on the channel, leave your comments below, and uh, check out the rich catalogue of over 1,200 episodes we have on podcasts under the stairs on any podcatching device or Spotify that you use. So stick around, enjoy the episode, and I'll speak to you very soon. The legend, Father Robertson, says that when a McGrief murders a blood relation, the latter does not die but turns into a vampire. Welcome back. So you've just heard the trailer for disc number 19 in the 88 Films Italian Collection series. This is Seven Deaths in the Cat's Eye, um, directed by Antonio Margheriti. Um Now, 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 the 88 Films uh, website has quite a bit of blurb about this one, so let's roll into this first before we start a review. Um, under the product description, the blurb for it says, The McGreef. A wealthy Scottish family are rocked by a grisly murder on their estate. There's been a murder. Um, the youngest, Corgina, uh, played by Jane Birkin from Blow Up, finds herself embroiled in an increasingly bizarre saga. As the bodies pile up, Cor- Corinja, uh, I, I pronounce it different every time, starts suspecting someone within her own family of the murders. Is it her arrogant cousin, James, played by Herman Keller? of Fellini's Satyricon. Their seductive French teacher, Suzanne, played by Doris Kuntzman eh, of Funny Games. Her own mother, Alicia, played by Dana Gaia of My Dear Killer. Or could it be the legend of the McGreef family? And can it be true? That any McGreef killed at the hands of another will bring about a vengeful curse on the whole clan. Italian film legend Antonio Margheriti, who directs The Long Hair of Death, which we will be covering upcoming on the 80 Films series, uh, delivers the stylish gothic giallo with all the visual panache that made him the icon he is today. And Ritz Ortoloni of Cannibal Holocaust fame supplies a beautiful score to this lushly shot creeper. So bask in the glory of this new 2K scan courtesy of 88 Films. The um, overall special features for this one is a 2K restoration from the original camera negative, a restored English soundtrack, restored Italian soundtrack with newly translated English subtitles, audio commentary from a genre expert and a podcast under the stairs fave, Troy Holworth, um, English trailer, Italian trailer, and an interview with Ed Dorado Margheriti. Right, um, so... So, 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 let's, let's just get into this one. Um, this movie wasn't very good. <laughs> right, I'll put that out front. Uh, that's not to say that I didn't find things that I really enjoyed about it, but it wasn't very good. Um, in terms of a uh, kind of plot synopsis, it is kind of what it says on the tin there. Um, it is this kind of idea of this girl has been sent back 
to rejoin our family in the midst of weird deaths that are occurring with this curse and this cat that appears to be everywhere. And we have to link it in because that's what we do in Jallos. It has to have colours or animals or numbers. Um, and if we link them all together, that's how you do a title. Um, I think the reason I kind of had a bit of trouble with this one is that... And I will stress that I love the combination of the kind of gothic horror element that Italian cinema does. I think the 60s were almost um, a renaissance for for horror in general in Italy, but the way they adapted this kind of stylings of hammer horror cinema and brought them over, you only have to look at things like The Whip in the Body by Mario Bava, once again Black Sunday by Mario Bava, or Black Sabbath by Mario Bava, that you start to see that, you know, this idea of gothic horror cinema, they had it fucking nailed. They really, really did. It was stylish, uh, it could be colourful, or even if it was monochrome, you would get these phenomenal shots, these amazing set pieces. Um, and so that side of things, you know, I, when, when you bring that into your films, I'm, I'm cool with that. I can, I can deal, is what I'm saying. I can deal with that shit. Um, and Jallo, obviously, we, we all know about that. Um, I don't need to explain what a Jallo is on this episode again. We've all been there. We've all seen it. Um, you know, th- there was a lot of directors doing it. Uh, a lot of directors playing into the, the, the kind of Jallo handbook because it was very, very, very popular. And when this movie comes out, it's 1973, which is on the cusp of the decline of Giallo, so, well, the big boom, uh, which I think realistically kicked out of place, it was 74, 75, uh, was when things started ramping down, and you really only had a few uh, titles becoming very, very popular, but for, uh, realistically, about a three-year period, like 73, 73, it was one of the most popular uh, genres of cinema, in Italy, and everyone was going to see them. And you would go; there would be two or three out in the same week, and everyone was going to check them out. And they became more absurd and ludicrous as they went on. And yeah, so you, you've got a combination of two genres at a time when it's kind of just on its cusp for waning. The reason it waned, like a lot of things, is that it was just unto death, wasn't it? Um, ideas became less original. Uh, and not only that, you got this idea of things becoming more fantastical, the plot becoming more um, unbelievable in the reveal of the killer, that audiences just became disengaged with it. Um, it's like anything else, when you have too much of something in a short period of time, you sicken yourself of it. Uh, and that is kind of kind of where we exist with Seven Deaths and the Cat's Eye. Um, my big gripe is that I just found the movie overall not giving either side the full attention that it needs. So yeah, the gothic horror stuff is kind of done cool, but it's not done as stylish as I had seen movies do in this time period. And the Jallo bit's kind of dumb, and they're kind of trying to link it to something supernatural is holy Scooby-Doo-esque. Um, so you've got that going that way. Um, that it never really carves out its own niche. And it should be because it's trying something a bit different. It's bringing in different styles together. Where this one should be one that stands out remarkably. This one doesn't. Um, you, when watching this, are kind of lost in this idea of... Not only who the killer is, but what sort of movie you're watching. I mean, it's kind of almost shot like a Hammer Horror vampire movie, and it alludes to certain aspects that of vampirism that might be in the movie. Um, the cat appears to appear quite a lot around the deaths, uh, or even me maybe being involved in some of the deaths. So, is the cat the killer? Is this Poe-esque? Is this like the black cat? Is that where we're going with it? Um, there is weirdly a gorilla in this movie, don't get me fucking started in it. Um, so could that be the killer? Is there like some weird gorilla that's managed to make its way into the house? Um, is it a murder mystery? Is it conventional? Is it grounded in reality? Um, is our killer human after all? Are we using all these things, like I say, in a Scooby-Doo fashion, so they're all red herrings? Um, and then mixed in with that, you have weird... 
uh, casting choices. You have some like really strong actors and actresses in this movie, but the mismatch of them being placed together works in a, a tonally weird way where some of them are given a bit more clout and depth than other actors are doing, and as such, the juxtaposition of of the acting styles almost kind of pulls you out of it a wee bit. Very, 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 very strange. Very, very, very strange. Um, it's it's a, a hodgepodge and a mess. It's trying to do too much. Uh, it's trying to cater to too much. And as such, it is just messy to watch I wasn't sure where we were going with anything my, one of my biggest struggles as you can tell by my accent and if you know this podcast is I am Scottish uh, and I found no justifiable quantifiable reason for this movie being set in Scotland none of the characters are Scottish um, the McGreef uh, sounds like a horrible horrible McDonald's sandwich yeah, I'm at grief. I'll have a grief, please. Um, I, 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 you know, I just a grief meal is what it's like a happy meal, except that when you open it, you're left with sorrow. Oh, um, which I think is most kids when they open a happy meal, anyway, isn't it? But yeah, the the stuff they start talking about to do with vampires in this movie, the mythology they allude to, uh, is nowhere near Scotland. So I don't understand why we're, you know, why it's supposed to be. Um, set in Scotland, it clearly isn't set in Scotland either, uh, this is clearly shot in Italy, and nowhere near Scotland, so I don't get that, I don't understand that, it's a weird choice, uh, it never fits, it's never paid off or explained as to why we've chosen this here, just set it in Italy, I think that just makes more sense, but that's not to say that everything in the movie is a complete washout for me, um, whilst the kills aren't the greatest kills I've ever seen, the setup is is pretty fun, the way they're shot is super stylish, um, and the cinematography in the movie at point is is you jaw droppingly gorgeous. Um, the the print that eighty eight films has put out at times is a bit patchy. Um, it's not the best work they've done uh, by any stretch of the imagination, uh, and a few shots looked overtly grainy, which made them kind of stand out almost as extras added into the final cut. And I wasn't overly keen on that; it kind of took me out. But yeah, the, the deaths in the movie are good. Like I say, the acting is of a, of a higher standard, even though I don't think the combinations of actors and actresses work well together on the screen. Um, watching the, the movie, it's hard to deny that they got a great cast involved uh, in the making of this movie. Then when you swing it out also to um, the score itself, which is done by Ritz Ortolone, um, who's most notably you know, kind of famous for doing the, the Cannibal Holocaust soundtrack. I think it's brilliant here. I think um, he mixes kind of gothic, kind of horror stylings with that kind of psychosexual, psychedelic um, style, which he's known for in his scoring as well, which works really great in some of the, the dream sequences or the kind of the stained glass Elements. I mean, the colour scheme at times here is very Argento-esque, um, with, with shades of Bava kind of peppered through. So all that works great. Um, it just, unfortunately, using those two names is where the big problem comes up. Uh, the gothic horror elements evoke Bava, but they're nowhere near as good as what Mario Bava had done in the past and would go on to do. The giallo elements are, you know, reminiscent of something that maybe Argento would do but they're nowhere near as good as what Argento would do. So what you have is kind of a pretender to two thrones instead of a pretender to one throne, which is what a lot of kind of 71, 72, 73 giallos are as pretenders to the Argento throne. Uh, you get some notable standouts from, from you know, names like uh, uh, Martino or even Filci or, you know, uh, Lado and stuff like that who are doing great movies out there anyway that are not necessarily pretenders but reinventing what the, the idea of a giallo is. But Margaretti here just feels like he's playing off a lot of tropes and kind of ticking boxes uh, rather than actually bringing anything fresh to the, the table. Um, there are a few, few in here 
uh, scenes which are very, very, very dark as well, which doesn't help. And like I said before, I don't think the, the 88 films transfer is all that great overall. Um, I think what you have is some scenes where the print is a bit too grainy, some scenes where the print hasn't been cleared up enough so it's a bit dark. And I have been okay with most of the 88 films prints thus far, but this, I would say, is my least favourite transfer they've done yet. Uh, which which kind of feels a bit, you know, feels like a bit of a, a, a shame, but there's not a lot... Um, not a lot we can do about that now. I believe this has also been released in America by Blue Underground. I'd be quite interested to see what the difference is between the two prints and see if uh, Blue Underground uh, managed to do it better. Um, I don't often jump into too much of uh, the kind of special features, but I don't really have that much more that I want to say about the movie, and as such... I kind of feel like I'm shortchanging you by finishing so early. So I will say that the one of the interviews on here is with uh, Edorado Maraghetti. That's the son of the director. Um, it's about 12 minutes long. It's a really interesting interview. He talks a lot about his father's involvement with um, uh, Bava, you know, how they were friends, uh, his time... Uh, as a filmmaker, how he was portrayed in the Italian press, how he managed to learn his craft when he was like a, I think was just like a teenager, he was like 13, 14 years old, uh, when he started working on things um, and his, you know, uh, in editing and filmmaking and stuff then. Uh, we don't go very deep on anything, but it's a, it's a nice little piece that's been added here. Um, I did switch the audio commentary on for a while when watching the movie the, the second time through. Uh, mostly because I do like Troy. He's been on the show before. I own his books. I will have him on the show somewhere down the line when his new book drops. Um, but I, I really do like the way he, he, he describes things and Troy doesn't um, mince his words on things. Uh, when it comes to his particular commentary here, I, I feel that him, this is maybe not one that he has a lot of fondness for and as such he spends a lot of time, a lot of time, talking about people in the movie and their association with other movies uh, and people um, in the periphery of the film itself than he actually does specifically critiquing or talking quite a lot about the movie. That being said, I could listen to Troy, you know, um, do the old uh, red string conspiracy theory thing, linking things to different projects and all the rest, all the people that he talks about, fascinating, he gets some really good industry stories here, but yeah, it's, I mean he, he, you listen, I can listen to him talk over it and it's good to see someone point things out and I enjoy it, but yeah, he's uh, it's one of these ones where I get the feeling he doesn't spend a lot of time talking about the movie because he probably isn't the biggest fan of the movie um, and maybe something that I'll query him about or, or, or chin him on uh, somewhere down the line when we chat about it. Uh, yeah, overall, Seven Deaths in the Cat's Eye was a bit of a letdown for me, if I'm honest. Um, it gets one of the lower scores of a film in the 88 Films Italian Collection series thus far. And this pains me to say it because it is a genre that I love. Uh, two genres that I love combined together, which should mean that I am doubly entertained. And I just wasn't. There's a lot in this movie that just leaves my head itching uh, to be scratched uh, in confusion. Um, Seven Deaths in the Cat's Eye gets a 2 out of 5 for me. I would say this is a skippable title. I don't say that lightly either. Uh, if you're a, you know, a Jalo purist and you're, you're desperate to try to check out all the ones from the, the, the father or motherland, then yeah, you probably want to try and see this at some point. I wouldn't rush out and buy it. Buy this one when it's in a sale somewhere and you can pick it up nice and cheap. 